The following interview was conducted with Professor Mary F. F. Baumgartner for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on March the 18th, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interview was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. I'm the fifth of eight children born to Joe and Eva Baumgartner. Where were you born? I was born on a farm in three miles south of Wellington, Texas, in the in the southeast corner of the Panhandle of Texas. Um, we grew up on a farm in the first, in fact, the first two or three years that of grade school when I started to school, five of us boys rode three horses to school. Uh, I'm the fifth of eight children, the first five of us were boys and then uh, a girl and a boy and a girl were born after I was born. Um, we all graduated from Wellington High School and then Texas Tech had just opened its doors a few years before my oldest brother graduated from high school. He set the he set the pace, and all eight of us children have one or more degrees from Texas Tech University. At one time, a few years ago, we figured that there had been at least 150 years of Bumgardners at Texas Tech. Now, grandchildren and some great-grandchildren now have gone to Texas Tech. What was campus like, and what was your major while you were there? I mean, did you live on campus? I lived on campus. In fact... <clears throat> It seems strange in today's culture in this country, but all eight of us earned our way. All of us had to work our way through college. Um, and what did you do? Well, I, my first job was working in the dormitory, in, 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 uh, in the dining hall, in the dormitory. And I later became a counselor, in the, as a, an upperclassman counselor, in the, and uh, didn't work in the dining room, but had... Uh, had other jobs in the in the dormitory, and then in my junior and senior years, I was uh, given part time work in the department, and I was majoring in crop and soil science. Okay. In the faculty of agriculture. Okay. Um, and when did you receive your degree? And then afterwards, did you go on to grad well, school? Or <clears throat> I I became a draft draftable age as I just after I finished high school and uh, when I was first called I was put in 4F because of a hernia and was never I was called a second time but was put in 4F but I stayed on the farm for two years after graduation from high school to help my dad farm and then didn't go to school go to college until 1946 when my sister also had just finished high school so she and I uh, entered college together and uh, graduated together in mm -hmm. 1950. Okay. And at the end of my high, uh, my college, I had, during the final year of college, I had applied for a job with the Methodist Board of Missions to teach in an agricultural college in India. That was a three-year program which I've been told that it was the predecessor or the model on which the Peace Corps was founded, but it's founded by the Methodist Church, uh, which, which began such a program right after the war as an act of reconciliation in Japan, and they, they, uh, they recruited 40 young American college graduates to go to Japan many of them to teach English, but they had other kinds of jobs too. But it was a three-year assignment, and that was so successful, the program in Japan was that they, and India was going through a terrible time right after they gained independence and the in Hindu-Muslim wars. Millions of people, there were refugees and lots of hungry people, and the Methodist Church started a similar program in India. So they recruited 50 young people to go to India, and I was one who volunteered for that program and spent three remarkable years, life-changing years in India. Tell us, just share a little bit. What was it like? What were you doing over there, and where were you located? I was located at the city of Allahabad, which is in the 
It's located in the junction of the two holy rivers, the Ganges River and the Jumna River uh, in north central India. And I and the campus of the college where I worked was right on the banks of the Jumna. And every year during the between the full moon in January and the full moon in February, that 28 day period was the auspicious time for Hindus to come to bathe in the holy waters where these two rivers join. And this is where Mahatma Gandhi's ashes were brought for immersion in the holy waters after his assassination mm -hmm. in 1948. But Allahabad was a very, it's a famous old city, not well known around the world, but it was the home of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. That's where he and his family had been in their family for many generations, mm. uh, the, the family home. And so it was a just a remarkable time to be in India. At this time when India was beginning their experiment with democracy without under without. their own control. And so it was a an auspicious time. I have I often think that I had a tiny bit to do with the green revolution in India as I was beginning to teach and help the institute where I was, although it was the Mission Institute, we had a rather sizable uh, gift from the Ford Foundation to help develop the first teaching of extension, agricultural extension people in India. And, and we helped to write some of the extension bulletins in sure. the, the be very beginning right. of the extension. The school that you were at, was it uh, male and female? Was it co-ed? It, co uh, it, it was co-ed. It had only about 300 students and about... Um, I was it think a four-year program? Twenty-five were women, and the rest were men. Mm -hmm. About a four-year program. Four-year program. Okay. It gave bachelor's degrees. Uh -huh. yeah. At what? At that time, in the early fifties, many of the early leaders in agriculture in India came through that mission school before India had its own large government government schools. One of the greatest. Things and I don't think this is well known about Nehru. One of his greatest ambitions as as prime minister was to emphasize the development of strong, outstanding universities throughout India, right. and he did. And we can see the results of what's happening in India today. With right. Him. Yes. Well, after your three year, what then? What was next? Tell us. Uh, during my final year in India, I I applied to about. I don't know, 10 or 12 different universities in the U.S. for graduate study. That experience in India gave me time to think about what I wanted to do with my life. And it was very obvious that I needed more education. And so I applied for what, the University of California, Davis, uh, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Cornell, Purdue, uh, several other universities. And uh, Purdue, I got the best... Uh, free grant fellowship offered from Purdue than I got from any other university. So I ended up here in September 1953. Okay. Were you married at that time? No, or no. Did you meet your wife here? I met her. She's a Hoosier. Okay. I had to come to Indiana to find, get a wife. <laughs> well, then tell us about what, the, and were you, was this in agronomy? You were hired this was in agronomy. Okay. And uh, To do your graduate work? To do my graduate work. I came here as a uh, on a master's uh, research assistantship, worked with Dr. Stanley Barber, who is now gone, but a remarkable uh, expert in plant nutrition and um, uptake of nutrients from soils, the mechanisms of these kinds of things. And I was intrigued by that and had some excellent, excellent training mm -hmm. under his tutelage. And... Uh, the, the head of the department at that time was Dr. John Peterson, an outstanding, another very outstanding uh, uh, person who made tremendous contribution to Purdue University. Mm -hmm. And then after you finished, did you get your, both your master's? I, I, had, I had a very funny, mixed-up career. I had turning points many times in my career. 
because of my India experience, as I was finishing my master's degree, a couple of representatives from the National Council of Churches in New York came to Purdue to see me, to ask me if I would, as soon as I finished my degree, come to New York City for a year and a half and be a, the, a co-secretary to organize an international conference of Christian students to be held on the campus of Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And that was to be held the last week in uh, December 1955. I finished early Your in masters. spring, my mm -hmm. master's early in spring. And that was a crazy idea. I hear I had just completed a master's in soil science and they wanted me to come. And this involved... See, this is soon after the war, and lots of these kinds of activities had been put on hold for a number of years. And so the time was ripe for a, a, an international Christian conference. And I and at, I'd also met Marilee, and we got married uh, in April of 55. So our honeymoon trip was a, a drive to New York City. To move into a new home in New New Jersey and to work for a year and a half for the National Council of Churches. Uh, that was a nice experience, but after after that experience, uh, I had agreed. I had been invited by my Indian colleagues to come back to India to teach after my master's degree in in agronomy, soil, and crop science. I was invited to come back and continue my teaching and begin a research program in India. And so, Marilee and I agreed to that, and they wanted us to take some special training at Yale University. So we went to Yale Divinity School for a year after a master's degree in soils, went to Yale again Divinity School for a year where our first child was born. And... Uh, uh, after we'd finished a year of special study in history and, and theology and a, a course in the theory and practice of communism, because communism was rampant in many parts of the world and they wanted us to have some understanding of what it was all about. Anyway, uh, after that year of study in, in, uh, at Yale, uh, we were waiting shipment to India, all of our few earthly possessions. Bye-bye. Our earthly possessions were in uh, New York, waiting shipment. And we came to visit Marilee's family in Indiana for a month and then to Texas for a month. This was the summer of 57. And as we were uh, ready to leave for New York, we had a call from New York stating that the Indian government had refused us visas. And we didn't have a, we didn't have a well thought through plan B. So I called my former major professor at Purdue University. Classes were to begin the next week. This was late the last week in August in 1957. And I asked Dr. Barber if there was any way that I could get a half-time assistantship. By then, we had one small child and were expecting a, a second. And uh, he said, I'll call you tomorrow. I'll, I'll look around. He called me the next day, offered me a half-time assistantship and for teaching. And we got in our car and headed for Indiana and been with Purdue ever since. Great. <laughs> since the, the fall of 57. Okay. What did you do for housing? What was housing like when you came then? And this would be, and you came for in Grand That's Grimey. right. We there. There was a two-story, large, white wooden structure at the corner of Wood and Grant. It's where the south. It's now the south end of the Young Graduate Building. We were on the corner, the northeast part of that corner. 
we lived with our two sons in the lower half. Sonia, Marjoram, and Dale and their two sons lived on the floor above us. And so it was very close to the... the um, the Life Science Building had been completed in 54, and I, I was one of the graduate students who helped us to move out of the current agriculture, it's now the current administration building in agriculture. My graduate student office was above the dean's office today in, the, in that building, but I was one of the many graduate students who helped to move into the Life Science Building in the summer of 1954. Very good. Uh, so after I started my degree, I came back to Purdue, and uh, we've been here ever since. We lived in that house until on Wood, Wood and Grant until the bulldozers came to push down that house to build the... And then by that time, we had been back at Purdue for three years, and we bought a, a new national home across town on the over by the south of the aluminum plant okay. but we lived in that for several years and then built a house west of town that's out there and where you were in timbercrest right? in, at timbercrest okay now you got your phd because i got my phd in the early 60s right after getting my phd again because of my international experience i was approached by the ford foundation through Purdue, I said I will not, I will not cut my ties with Purdue. Purdue had offered me once I got my PhD. I was offered a, a tenured, Faculty. track position. And, uh, but, well, it is actually my department head called me in. Marion, the Ford Foundation has come to me. They want a young faculty member to come and be. An agricultural specialist for them in Argentina for two years. Argentina has serious political problems and other kinds of problems. Would you and your family be willing to go? You would be go you'd be going as Purdue staff members. You wouldn't cut your ties with Purdue. Purdue a foundation will contract with Purdue to send you. You'll be paid by Purdue University with Ford money. Well, we decided to go, three small children. And in August 1964, we left, flew out of the Purdue airport and flew to Mexico City and stopped to see Ford Foundation operation there, stopped in Peru to see Ford Foundation operation, Santiago, Chile, and then to Buenos Aires. So we had a good, we stopped along the way to see what the Ford Foundation was doing in some of the other countries. So it wasn't just plopping us down in San uh, Buenos Aires without any other knowledge of the Ford. But having also worked with Ford in, our, in India, that also had some bearing. And I'd had uh, a wonderful thing about working with an organization like Ford. It opens doors that a university doesn't open for you. Doors in Argentina, the two years I was there as a young faculty member at Purdue, Occasionally, I would get a call from the Minister of Agriculture. Marion, my, I'm flying out to Pergamino tomorrow to one of our large agricultural experiment stations. Would you like to go with me? I'd like for you to go with me if you can. So there were a, a number of times when I would fly with the Minister of Agriculture in his plane around Argentina. Just He was helping me to understand the agricultural, the complexities of ag agriculture in Argentina. So, and they also were familiar with the Ford Foundation, who'd been around for a long time. That's right, and and uh, well, well, he, <laughs> but one of the one of the ironies of this is that there's there was a strong at that time a, a rather strong leftist or communist movement in Argentina, especially the students, and they didn't. They didn't associate the Ford Foundation uh, as a separate uh, philanthropic organization. They, they associated with the Ford Motor Company, and this was an imperialism taking over Argentina, Ford imperialism taking over Argentina. So I was always wrestling with that 
uh, as a as a mm -hmm. as baggage that I had to carry. Right. Yeah. Um, but that was a marvelous experience for our children. Our children went to a, the two the two older ones were old enough to go to school, and so they went to what was called the Lincoln School, and it was run. It was run by Americans, but it was the teachers were all Spanish, Argentine teachers, and our our, our children would take. Uh, their classes in English in the morning and take the same classes after lunch in Spanish. So, you know, our children within a few months were fluent in Spanish. Sure. And uh, so it was a wonderful experience for them. What was the housing like for you down there? Very difficult. Uh, we stayed in a hotel for about six weeks before we could find a house that was suitable. But you had to find it. it on your own, in other words. Well, the Ford Foundation, of course, helped us. Sure. But, uh, and they provided us an automobile. But after six weeks, we had a, a house that was uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice section of one of the suburbs, northern suburb along the river, a beautiful section and a lot of, it was an international community. We lived right down the street from uh, our daughter's best friends were two little English girls whose family was with the British military in Argentina, her, her, their dad. But... We met, in, in, through the school, we met, uh, you know, we met embassy people from all over the world, and our children went to school. At the American school, there were children from embassy, Japanese, uh, sure, sure. English, French, whatever. Sure. But uh, it, that was another, um, just another fantastic experience, professionally as well as personally for the, for right. the family. Sounds like it, yeah. And so we came back in '66 to a new, uh, to a new start. I just completed my PhD before I went away, and I had not yet started my own research. But that experience in Argentina, and when I came back to Argentina, uh, to to Purdue, Purdue had just received its first NASA grant to help plan. The, uh, NASA had named Purdue in 1966 a center of excellence for engineering and agriculture relating to their space program. And they were on the drawing board. It had not been delivered, but on the drawing boards was the first polar orbiting satellite system where if the satellite is uh, in polar orbit, as it goes around and around, as, as it's still in the same orbit, but the tur Earth is turning. And so every time it goes around, it's looking at a different part of the Earth. And that first satellite, first Earth orbiting satellite, which was finally launched in July 1971, and we already had software developed. We've been working with aircraft data and NASA high altitude aircraft data and so but it was exciting to be in this whole new area of developing the computer software that has made, it's, it's made a tremendous contribution in making the digital camera possible today. Right. Because we, we had, so my entire professional career from 64 on has been working as a soil scientist. I've been working with electrical engineers, geologists, foresters, uh, computer scientists, uh, this multidisciplinary group that a lot of people think started at Purdue with Dr. Jiski. <laughs> and we were doing this for 30 years before yeah. Jiski ever came right. to Purdue. Yeah. But we were dealing with problems with that required interdisciplinary thinking. So I was a part of this team that developed the software that could take this sensor data it's being beamed back from our entire around the globe in many different wave bands and each wave band sees something different and we're the ones who had to figure out how to how to describe those differences when you're analyzing it when we're analyzing it yeah. and that was exciting I had my major thrust and my research, uh, my graduate students, 
the graduate students I directed during, during, during those period, then during that 30 year period, or the last 30 years of my career, we were interested in studying global change. But I was interested in looking at the terrestrial ecosystems. What's, what's changing on the Earth's surface, on the land surfaces, and the biological, the biology that's on these land surfaces? How is that changing? And one of the most, one of the first exciting things we could see was how rapidly the forests or the, the tropical rainforests are disappearing in Brazil or in northern Thailand. See, we're seeing the whole world. And it gave me just a, a different perspective. Everything is connected as you could not conceive it any Before other Before there, right. Everything is connected. And that just opened up my whole career. And Did being, that lead into uh, the Lars, your work involvement with that? So, well, it was first called Lars, the Laboratory for Agricultural Remote Setting. We later changed that. After about three, na three years working with NASA, we decided it needed to be much broader than agriculture. So we changed it, kept the acronym, but L Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing. Mm -hmm. And being one of the first appliers of this data to an Earth problem, that is soil, terrestrial ecosystems especially, I was invited all over the world to give lectures and to give short courses. You were also a uh, well, NASA program leader for the Earth Science Research that's of right, Lars, that's for right. Lars, uh, right. And yeah. then later became director of Lars. Right, but, right. but at the same time, NASA and the National Academy of Sciences had their own committees related to these, so I served on several of these national and international committees, which would meet all over the world. So it just opened up fantastic opportunities. Just there at the right time. Yeah. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Through no, no, <laughs> no, uh, no wisdom no on my part, I was just there at the <laughs> right time. Yeah. And then what did, uh, afterwards, um, what tell about your interaction with the students? Working with the students who had grad students, and did you, you did some te teaching as well? Oh, all the time. I I kept, I always kept at least one t course per semester going at the, in the agronomy department. I did not want to lose my con contact there. Now, one of the problems: interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary activity. One of the problems it generates or results one of the problems that results is as Bob Greencorn who used to be vice president and, and head of the research foundation uh, uh, dean of research Bob, and I used to meet with him on a monthly basis when I, especially when I was director of Lars he'd say Bob Gardner Lars is a throwaway organization. It's all it's funded all by contract money. Once once your contract's finished, Lars is finished. Oh he used to tell me that the university is a collection of medieval fiefdoms. And what he meant by that was budget wise we're set up by 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 deans or, or schools or colleges and departments. And every dean has his own uh, his fiefdom, and he has his own budget. And once you start trying to get two deans to work together and share their budget, whenever money gets tight, multidisciplinary activities vanish. And that was the early days. That was before we really. This was a sort of a an experimental time. But but I must say that Dr. Greenforn was very supportive of our multidisciplinary activity. Mm -hmm. And the university in general, my, my, my dean and department head were very supportive. And, uh, but in, the, in our promotion, in our promotion process, process it goes up through the, the 
what's it called? The, the committee one, the committee of full professors within the department. You don't get anywhere if that committee doesn't push you up. And my department, most of the members of that committee had the foggiest notion what I was doing. Hey, I never see him around. He's not here. And so finally, uh, it, I think I'm, I was told that Dean uh, uh, Dick Coles, when he was Dean uh, at, at, a, at a department heads meeting, Bumgarner is not doing the typical thing, but he's one of the best known person in the world who's in doing it. He's going to get a promoted. I'm told that he went to bat in my promotion, in my promotion process. But uh, he realized the, the value. Right. Uh, that's one of the issues that needs to be addressed when we start talking. And and the great problems facing the world are not going to be need, going to be solved by any one discipline. They right. need the multidisciplinary research. Right. But we have to learn how to manage that right. financially as how well. to handle it. How to handle it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mentioned you were going to, uh, what was that, Soder, the World Soils? Uh, were you one involved? of the committees, I was invited once, there were about um, 20 soil scientists from around the world who were invited to a workshop in the Netherlands. And I was on sabbatical, and, and my wife and I were on sabbatical in Europe in 85, 86, that school year, 85, 86. And in January of 86, there was this meeting, international workshop on a soil digital database. How do we digitize and have a common database for all the soils of the world? And I was asked to that workshop. I was one of the participants in that workshop. And the head of the soil survey for the whole U.S., Dick Arnold, who had been a former professor at Cornell, a soils professor at Cornell, Dick and I were the only two Americans in that, the rest were from other countries around the world. But what came out of that workshop, which was in about a week, we covered a lot of territory, looking at different parts of the world, what is the status of our knowledge of those soils, how well had they been mapped, and many of them hadn't been mapped well at all. Anyway, we decided with the coming, with the developing Earth orbiting satellite technology, we had a we had a new source of good data that we'd never had before. And very few soil scientists had yet, in, this was in 76, even though we had four years of data, very few soil scientists had ever even been exposed to any of it. Coming out of this uh, workshop, I was asked to edit and, and write the report from that conference. And in talking with the executive committee or the, the, my committee that helped me put that together, we then took a proposal to the International Soils Congress held in Hamburg, Germany in August of 86, a proposal to try, a proposal to develop a world soils and terrain digital database at a scale of one to a million. Now that's not very detailed, but it would be so much better if we had a standardized map at that scale for the entire Earth's surface, the land surfaces of the world. That would be better than anything we ever had before. So we went after, we, we took that proposal to the International Soils Congress where I was, and I was asked to make the proposal to the to the business session of that at that Congress, it was approved, and then we went after funds. Uh, the United Nations, United Nations Environment Program, which with their international headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, they were so interested in soil de uh, desertification and land degradation all over the world, they funded us for the first five years. So we st set up workshops around the world, one in Montevideo, one in Morocco, one in various parts of the world, and set up, and, and the project was managed in the Netherlands at the International Soil Reference and Information Center in the Netherlands. And so for years I served as chair of the SOTER. SOTER is an acronym for Soils and Terrain. 
soil and terrains. And uh, so the Soter project is still going on and uh, uh, there's a very active group redoing all the soils of Europe to, in a common database. And it's being done in, it's not in, in a, we don't hear much about it, but it's going on. It's going in many on, places right. in the It's world. continuing on, which it's is good. Right, okay. Uh, the uh, the um, Agronomy Research Center, were you ever involved in that at all, or that's out there in Mount Morency that's been going oh, for that, then 50, well, it just oh. had its 50 years in 2000. Oh, I've been, I've had, I've had many research plots out there through mm -hmm. the years. Right. Yeah. And you, and you had in your. In fact, we had that, that, that farm out there in our early days, before we ever had an orbiting satellite, the University of Michigan had an old DC-3 aircraft that had a scanner on it, an 18-band scanner that would look at both visible and infrared uh, regions of the spectrum and chop it up into 18 different weight bands. And this was a scanner that had been developed by NASA's, with NASA money, on a, on a DC-3 owned by the University of Michigan. And Michigan was sort of our competitor. They chose the analog, we chose the digital method of developing the software, and the digital one out. Of course, the world has gone digital. But that, even before we had a satellite, the Michigan plane was flying missions for us over flight lines here where we could go out in the fields and identify this was wheat and this is, and then use that. At, that was the forerunner to the satellites. It taught us the basic how software, it, how to speak. develop software for the satellite. Right, okay. Using a Michigan plane and an antique scanner system. It worked. Yeah. Now, in the 70s, mm -hmm. here's I another thing. In the 70s, we, there was no such thing as a color television. Mm -hmm. And we had all these colors that needed to be expressed in some way. So one of our engineers at an airport with a NASA engineer were sitting waiting on an airplane and on the back of an envelope. <laughs> it's a story that's told. Designed a television set that you could have put a that you could put three filters and take photographs of the screen with three different filters and come out with a color image. And IBM built one of those, the first color television set, so that we could do research for this multispectral data from for NASA. And uh, and when the first NASA was when the first NASA Earth observation satellite was launched and the first pass over the U.S. As soon as they got a tape for that pass, they flew it out to Purdue Airport. We took that, analyzed it using the IBM screen, made some color images, and sent back to NASA, who took it to Congress to show them what a fantastic technology was coming. But these are first First time things that were done here on this campus that got that helped NASA to be able to get the funding for these Earth orbiting satellites. Very good. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your other involvement in agronomy and anything else that you wanted to share with us? Or that's pretty much is it? Right? Well, I, Did you I, I, I developed the first course in agronomy that I developed the course first course on the use of remote sensing for land resources. Mm -hmm. And that became a very popular course, especially for international students who were coming to study. And they wanted to take that technology sure, back that's right. to right. their countries. When you stepped down from, what did you, you, when you were no longer the director at Lars, what was your, did you just continue on with your research? Uh, this goes into politics and the, when Reagan was elected to the presidency, up to that time, that 1980, up to that time, we had had grants from NASA. Grant, NASA, for, and for we've Lars. been named NASA Grants 
After 1980, everything became a contract. We had to show what we were going to do with that money, and if we didn't deliver what we said we were going to deliver. In the early days, we didn't know what we were going to deliver. <laughs> so it's fantastic to have a pot of money and, and be able to, if something wasn't going right, we'd change direction, and, uh, 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 we could alter. Once we came under contract, we couldn't do that. Not only that, after 1980, the contract money declined very rapidly to support Reagan's Star Wars and civilian space research went down the drain. And so, I was in a period as a director of Lars in the 82 or three, three or, three or four, something like that. I had to write about 40 or 50 letters and say with, with, with professional electrical engineers and others that had been working in our lab, been working with them for several years, had a letter read and say, your next paycheck will be your last. Because that funding, the right. mass of funding, yeah. went down the tube. Right. Right. And so, what did I do? It got to me. Close friends I'd been working with for years, tell them. <laughs> and at the, at, at, uh, in 85, I said, uh, well, I'd been planning this for a year, but we went to Europe on a sabbatical for a year, and I worked for a, in a, in a research lab in Spain for six months and then went to the Netherlands for a few months. And uh, Chris Johansson then took over as director of Lars and it's, it was moved out of the research park. We had to vacate. Uh, it just downsized. It's still going, but it's being done piecemeal by individual professors who get research funds to yeah. work with satellite data. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not what it used to be, but it's there's still interdisciplinary research. And that's, that's the key. And that's the key, right? Um, you got some awards. Then you got the Arthur G. Hansen. Let's talk about some of the awards. You're a fellow of the American Society of Photographic and uh, Remote Sensing, um, and you got a Distinguished Agricultural Alumni Award from Texas Tech. How'd that come about? Were you surprised at that? I was. I think you know, you, you never. You never get an award unless somebody nominates you. And I just had friends that nominated others. Most of these awards, I didn't know I was. Well, it's nice to be surprised. It is. It's, it's, it's pleasurable, and, and you have to go. Uh, I have no idea. why. In, in the early 80s, I was just got a letter one day from the president of DePaul University asking me if I was available to attend the graduation ceremony at DePaul that year, 82 or 3. And he said, uh, you will be the first doctor of science that DePaul University has ever given, honor a doctor of science. I, I never did even find who nominated. I don't, I, I still have no That's idea right. who nominated me. But here's one I think is that uh, Agricultural Alumni Association Certificate of Distinction yeah. in 2005. And something I read said, for Dr. Global Agriculture. It's a little, that's very that's complimentary. That's very nice. Well, those are in, nice awards because I know there's the, others that have gotten them. In the two or three, well, in the nineties, I served on. I was the representative of the International Society of Soil Science on what was what is called code data. That is a part of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program of the United Nations. And its headquarters are in Sweden. Sweden said, "If you'll put your headquarters here, we'll provide the building." And one of their big programs has been the International Geosphere Biosphere, uh, the the study what's happening to the terrestrial ecosystems of the world. And I became the vice chair of a terrestrial ecosystem committee of CODATA, which met in different parts of the world as we're studying what we were trying. Our big thrust in the early days, what are the species of plant or fish? What are the species of biological being entities? What are the species that are most sensitive to any change in temperature or moisture? Once you can die, uh, once we can, once we can 
pinpoint which species are most sensitive to any change, then we follow what's happening to that species. One of the things we found that was that the, the some of the what what do you call it the, the biomass in the at the South Pole because of the high ultraviolet light that's getting through because of the of the ozone the high ozone the uh, it's destroying some of the very beginning of the food chain that certain fish eat on, and then they, these fish are eating on other fish, and they're eating on other fish. And it's destroyed, and, and, and we were able. But anyway, we just had various committees that were looking looking in, in different, in the, in the frigid region, in the temperate region, in the, and, and in the tropical Our region, southeast. looking for those species that are most sensitive to any change. And that was fascinating to be rubbing shoulders with people in these different and, and one of our meetings was held up in uh, Trondheim, Norway up in the fridge <laughs> and we met in the Morocco another meeting so we held and I hosted one of the meetings in uh, Maryland a friend of mine is head of the geology geography department in Maryland and I got him to host us at the University of Maryland a meeting here in the US but and you pray a price in living this kind of professional career because you're crossing professions and that doesn't give you that doesn't get you promotions and recognition in your narrow field. So any 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 word I've gotten cuts across I it's can see not, from that I see it's where not the narrow as your research did. So it, it's it's tandem, it goes with it. All right. You served on a couple of presidents. You were here. Doctor Hovde was here when you were Hovde here. was here. And then Doctor Hansen and Dr. Barron and Dr. Jeske. All right. Each has their own That's different right. style. That's right. yeah. Dr. Hovde had been here for a long time. He was here when I came. <clears throat> Dr. Hovde was an interesting character. <laughs> I remember when I was a young staff member. I think I might have been still working on my PhD. I guess I was. When I was invited to, he used to hold, uh, used to hold receptions at his house over on 7th Street in the old Spanish style home and he was so formal he would stand in his large dining room and and he'd have somebody would ask us our name as we came in dark and then he, and it was all so formal we'd pass through shake hands with Dr. Harvey and going out and we, receiving line and then when when Hanson became president his, his first years, he didn't he wouldn't live in that house he moved in the Stewart had gone by then and he moved in the West Wing West Westwood. Westwood. <laughs> you may have been at that at that reception when Hanson, he was on his horse and there were bales of hay sitting around <laughs> in, the, in the front yard for people to sit on. <laughs> and Hanson greeted you. He was riding his horse. <laughs> so different. <laughs> sounds, sounds like that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of other things. How Chauncey Village has changed. I usually ask the people that. It's changed since you've been here. Chauncey Village. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Yes. Oh, my. Yes. Yeah. I remember, I can remember when John Irvine, Jack, Jack Irvine, had a card table in the front of the old Southworth store, and he would sell, he would arrange travel for you. That's where his travel business started. He had a card table in the front of Southworth's bookstore that would help you arrange your flight to <laughs> London. <laughs> mm. And there were more, I understand there were more stores, and it's it's changed, you know, over time. Um, dramatically. And uh, so has, well, so has the levy, even since I've been here. Oh, you, uh, what, what, what? Uh, after Sears, that stood empty for years, and it was such an eyesore. And my goodness, what the the the, the architecture and so on, what has gone on has such a great improvement. Right. Yeah. It, it, you're right. Forgotten it had been in, uh, a vacant for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, how about a um, got a favorite tradition of Purdue? Favorite tradition, tradition. of Purdue. Purdue tradition. 
I guess one of the things that Marilee and I have enjoyed so much is, is the Christmas show. And we've never gone to it alone. Once some Greek, a Greek scientist was visiting us and we took him to the Christmas show. And uh, years later he said, that I was on campus a number of times at Purdue, but the thing I remember most about Purdue was the Christmas show. That was the most wonderful experience I ever had. And through the years when I had uh, several graduate students, that would be our Christmas present to them. We'd, we'd, we'd gather for lunch at our house, then we'd have a, Chris, a tree decoration party, and then we'd go to the Christmas show with graduate nice students event. from China, with, from Africa, wherever. The, we'd just have all of my graduate students come in. And, we'd, we'd, and that became sort of a tradition with us to take graduate students who would never have that kind of facility in their area of the world, take them to the Christmas show. Very nice. And that's been a tradition with us through the years. That's very nice. Do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with the researchers? Any that comes to mind? You've shared a lot of your reminiscences, which has been wonderful. Well, I was asked, at, you know, uh, our, our department, the department I spent 40 years in, has done a remarkable job in keeping track of its uh, alums. And it's developed into a very nice, about a uh, semi-annual newsletter to alums. And it's not a, it's not a slipshod affair. It's a well done publication. It always has some wonderful stories from different alums, from many years to, sh to, to, to short years. But anyway, uh, the department asked me several, I was asked by the secretary of the department, and I'm sure he asked her to, to contact, asked me to give a, after having been retired for some years, what could you tell us about your career? And he always gives us a luncheon, the department head invites all retirees in the area. Uh, to come to lunch, and he provides the lunch, and then he, somebody is asked to make a presentation. And I thought for weeks, what in the world? Would, nobody wants to hear about my career, but I finally decided on the theme turning points and just about five different things that happened during my career that really completely changed my direction. And every one of those turns turned out to be a fantastic chapter in my life. And uh, that's sort of the way I feel. And I don't know of anybody else in the department who's had, <laughs> because my life has not been the typical. Mm -hmm. And in closing, any particular, any summary or comments that you'd like to make for the researchers? This was a nice ending though, it just as said. Well, the turning point. One, one of the things that, one of the things that I was concerned about for many years, was that we're graduating. Remarkably well-trained scientists. Who go out into the world and can't find London on the map. Or they don't know what states border Idaho. Or they go to work for a national, multinational corporation and they're sent off to Ecuador. They don't even know what continent Ecuador is in. So just a few years before my retirement, I made a proposal to the department that we offer a course in global understanding, global awareness. That wasn't as casual as that. I'd thought about this. One of my, I'd got one of my colleagues who's not traveled much, but uh, Lee Schweitzer, you may know Lee. Lee's a wonderful counselor and undergraduate teacher. That's his love, teaching undergraduate students. And he treats them all like human beings and uplifts everybody. But Lee helped me develop this. 
And of course, we were sort of laughed at in the department, but we finally got them to accept the idea. I said, this is appalling that we, we graduate people who are completely ignorant about world geography, completely ignorant, have a degree from Purdue University. This is not, this is not acceptable. So we started this course. We got it, had to take it through the faculty of the College of Agriculture, had to approve it. They finally approved it. We started out with 20 students, finally got in the loop, and it caught up. What we did, we have the most remarkable set of resources on this campus four to 5,000 international scholars from 130 or 40 countries, and most undergraduate students never have any contact with them. None. So we just started our course. The course is simply a seminar course. We get a different speaker from a different country, from a different culture, a different religion every week. And what we ask them to do, here's a bunch of Hoosier kids who don't know anything about the world. What would you like for them to know about Ethiopia? You know Gabisa, Gabisa Ajita, <laughs> six foot six inches tall, had two daughters. He's from Ethiopia, born in a little obscure village in Ethiopia. Had three six foot daughters who were on the West Lafayette High School gym, uh, uh, basketball, women's basketball team. But to have a guy like this, this black guy, handsome, six feet six inches tall, cultured to come in and introduce him and let him tell about the Horn of Africa. It's history and it's culture, and he does it in such a beautiful way. You, you always look around and see, who is this guy? But expose them to this kind of, so we'd have, you know, we'd, we'd have a different, from a different era of the world every week. And then our student, we'd get raved comments when we do an evaluation at the end of the semester. We had to move to a room in the education, new educational building. You can seat 120 people, and it's full every spring semester. Good. And now some students across campus are coming into it. Good. But just global awareness. Very good. But that's another thing that I'll never be remembered for that, but I made it happen. You got it on the tape. And it'll be right. We want to thank you very much, Dr. Baumgartner. This has been wonderful. And I know our researchers will benefit by it. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> very nice.